Hello, Buzzkillers. It's the old professor here, busting myths, taking names, talking about history in ways that you haven't heard it talked about before. And we are so lucky to be joined by Dr. Lindsay Chervinsky, who's been on the show before and who's back to talk about a book called Mourning the President's Loss and Legacy in American Culture, which she's edited with Matthew Costello. Dr. Matthew Costello, Dr. Travinsky, thanks so much for coming back on the show. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be back. This book is so interesting. All the books people send me are interesting, but I'm particularly interested in this because of the ways in which you talk about presidential deaths and funerals and memory and mourning and things like that. Uh, this is the kind of things we don't really talk much about on this show. And it's such an important topic. These are big, huge events. And, you know, I've never had a show on the death of Lincoln or, or the death of uh, FDR or anything like that. So I'm so glad, A, first of all, that you wrote the book, B, and uh, that you got the scholars to, to um, other scholars to contribute chapters and stuff like that. W what prompted you first to do the book with Dr. Costello? It's a great question. And it was really actually prompted by similar observations to what you just shared. We noticed in November of 2018, when, when former President George H.W. Bush died, the right. overwhelming outpouring of remembrances, of support, love, grief, and they were really bipartisan. They were across the board. And they often called on our contemporary moment to highlight his strengths. So, for example, they talked about his kindness, his mm -hmm. humility, his humbleness, his sense of humor. And whether or not people were explicit, they were drawing a contrast to what a lot of people noticed was the rancor of our partisan politics at this particular moment and, and the administration that was currently in the White House. And so there was this distinction that I don't think would have been there if he had died at a different time. And so huh. that got us thinking, how does the way in which a president dies, when a president dies, you know, what are the circumstances? How does that shape how we remember this person? And in a lot of ways, it tells us, tells us a lot about the president, of course, but it also tells us even more kind of about where we are as a country and where we are as a people and what our culture is at that moment, what our politics are like at that moment. And so we started kind of digging into it and thinking like, is this true for other presidents as well? And mm -hmm. it was our observation that the president is a huge figure in our politics. Of course, it's the most powerful position probably in the world, certainly in the country, and affects so much of our day-to-day -day existence. And yet, once they leave office, they're supposed to technically go back to being another citizen. And yet, these overwhelming morning rituals suggest that that's really not the case. And so it seemed like a really great opportunity to explore both the president's role in society and their legacy and how that is shaped and evolved, and then also the explicit moment of when a president dies and what that says about that moment. Well, in the introduction, or maybe it's in the preface, but I think it was in the introduction, you, you talked a little bit about how it's a little, it's slightly odd in the United States because uh, although the president is the head of state, he's the, he the head of one branch of government and supposed to be co-equal branches. It, it's not like a monarch dying. But in many ways, we, we have started to treat it, or we have treated it that way over the centuries now. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, for anyone who has recently watched the funeral processions and the mourning rituals around the death of Queen Elizabeth II, mm -hmm. they're a little bit more ostentatious than what we do, but not a whole lot. So, yeah. you know, the mo most recent examples of President Reagan and President H.W. Bush it was days of celebrations and the military was involved and there are honor guards and, you know, I mean, just huge, huge endeavors. And that's a little bit weird because, as you said, the president is the head of the executive branch, but there's this whole other thing called Congress and, of right. course, the judicial branch as well. And the founding of our nation was really a rebellion against the concept of monarchy. And yet we treat these people as though they're not average citizens. And so 
I think partly that's because the president is the only person that does represent all Americans. Our our Congress representatives are, you know, for our district or our state, they have so much more media attention, especially in the 20th and 21st century. But there is an element, I think, of us as an American people that likes to celebrate an individual like that. And we kind of just Mm -hmm. replaced the president with the king once we removed that from our political system. Now, we'll get on to the details of George Washington's funeral in a moment. But do you think one of the reasons that might have started is because we didn't choose a more administrative, bureaucratic first president like, say, John Adams or or Hamilton or something? We actually chose Washington, who was not only a, a soldier, in it, but also a symbol. So did that sort of set a precedent that the president is slightly above, even though technically, legally, constitutionally, he's not? But in, in reality, he is because Washington was the first one? I do think that contributed. One of the mm-hmm. you know interesting sort of ebbs and flows of American history is the role of the presidency. And there are periods of times, there are pockets, especially in the 19th century, where presidential power is sort of at a low. And especially like late 19th century and sort of, you know, 1830s, 1840s, after Jackson left office, there are times when the when the president is is less important. And those presidents, when they died, get less attention. But The fact that there is this example that the father of the country has just died and and people were referring to Washington as the father of the country before he even became president. Wow. The fact that he died, he had acted in a way that most felt was very admirable, that he had given up power twice. There was an enormous outpouring of, of real and sustained grief. And I know we'll talk a little bit more about some of the details, but it was really nationwide. And I think that does set the example. And then that, you know, sort of the continued celebrations of his life through the celebration of his birthday set the expectation that the president could be something else, depending on the person and the circumstances. Not necessarily a guarantee, Mm -hmm. but it certainly was possible. Well, let's get on to let's get on to the Washington funeral, because that's the first chapter in the book, but the the chapter is entitled, and it's a quote from Washington, that he wanted his funeral to be, quote, in a private manner without parade or funeral oration, end quote. And then you've subtitled it, well, the authors have subtitled, the author of this chapter, Mary Thompson, subtitled, The Funeral George Washington Wanted But Didn't Get. So, so what, what, yes. what, what happened? I mean, we don't, you know, I don't know anything. I didn't know anything about this until I read the book and, and I don't think buzzkillers know anything about this. It's just a very, very particular aspect of American history. Yeah. It's, it's a part of Washington's story that is not told too often. And Mary Thompson wrote an excellent chapter. She was for, she's now retired, but she was a historian at Mount Vernon for like four decades. And so mm-hmm. she will have forgotten more about Washington and Mount Vernon than anyone else could ever hope to know. Yeah. So what happened was that Washington really wanted to be private. He wanted to have a private family celebration. He wanted to have very little ceremony. He wanted to be buried in a family tomb. He wanted there to be a newly constructed tomb because the one that was currently on the estate was sort of in a bad location. Water ran by it, which anyone who can kind of envision what a tomb looks like, you don't really want a whole lot of running water around no, no, no. for longevity purposes. So he wanted a new tomb that was, you know, in better condition and in better location. But he didn't want it to be a national celebration. And I think that was for a couple of reasons. One, he recognized that it would be a painful moment for his wife if he predeceased her. But also, he did have these concerns about the fact that he was supposed to just be any other citizen, like the the concept Mm -hmm. that we've talked about, that presidents are not supposed to be these kings. And so I think he both strongly believed that. But he also worried that if there was this big celebration, would he be accused of wanting a big celebration and therefore wanting to be like a king. He was always very concerned about how any sort of public ceremony would affect his reputation, even after he died, because he was very aware of his role in history and very aware of his legacy long term. So he really just wanted this private ceremony, a couple of days, family members only. uh, And that was very much not what he got. He right away pretty much everyone involved, with the exception maybe of of Martha, started to throw wrenches in that plan. And that was because the American people demanded that they have some role to play. They also felt the loss 
of his presence and the symbolism that he provided and demanded that they have an opportunity to express that grief. So for example, local militias in Alexandria and the local George Mason, or excuse me, the local Mason groups, uh, they wanted to participate. So they uh, insisted that they would come march for the funeral. People asked for snippings of his hair, which we kind of find gross, but that was a, a, a typical yeah. no, that was mourning a thing process. Thing, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they would have these mourning rings or they would have the lockets enclosed or the lockets of hair enclosed in a special envelope. So people asked for that. Orations were delivered in churches and in ceremonies across the country. Congress, of course, had a big celebration. And one of the things that I think we perhaps would find most surprising to us because of the way our world works in the 21st century they staged mock funerals across the country. And this is an age, of course, before you can have televised funerals, before you right, can have right. social media. So they wanted to feel that they were a part of that process. And so churches and groups across the country staged these mock funerals so that people could come, pay their respects, and grieve appropriately. This is amazing. They're sort of in parallel and presumably in every uh, every one of the states. Yeah, pretty much everywhere across the country, there was some sort of option. Now, this was a time where there was fairly intense partisan divide, so that didn't go unnoticed. So, for example, yeah. Jefferson did not attend any of these ceremonies and was criticized pretty heavily for doing so. People commented that it was very petty for him not to go pay his respects which means that there were options for him to do so both in his home state of Virginia and also in Pennsylvania where Congress was currently seated. So mm -hmm. really everywhere from Georgia all the way up to Vermont, there were these mock funerals for people to pay respects, to give orations, to give speeches, and to sort of show themselves in mourning for Washington. And did they go so far as to have like representative coffins that obviously wouldn't have any anything in them or, or anything like that? Was there an attempt to mirror the main funeral to that level of detail? Yeah, they did. So for example, Washington died at home at Mount Vernon. And when Congress received the news, they established that the following week they would have their official mourning ceremonies. And there was a coffin placed in the chambers of Congress with a black shroud over it and a portrait of Washington to serve as sort of this symbolic coffin for the members of Congress to be able to pay their respects. Now, obviously, it was empty, but hmm. it did exist, and it was sitting there in the in the House chambers. And then, presumably, there were eulogies or speeches all across uh, in each of these funerals, but. Were there other eulogies and speeches at places where they weren't having necessarily a parallel funeral? You know, we think of national days of mourning and things like that, but was it that official and that intense? Well, there wasn't one day of mourning because of the slowness of right. news and the way that things traveled at the time, but there were sort of more official celebrations. So John Marshall gave the official eulogy in Congress. This is the, the eulogy in which he said he was, I'm going to, I'm going to butcher the order, but he says first in the battlefield, mm. first in the cabinet first in the hearts of his countrymen or something like that might've been swapped in those orders. Yeah. And these were words actually that Henry Lee had crafted, but had given to Marshall to use. So he gave one of these official eulogies and that was printed and republished and sent across the country. New York city designated governor Morris as the official mm -hmm. eulogy giver for their ceremony. And that was printed and shared. So each state, especially if there was a big city and they were having a big celebration, they would often print copies of the eulogies and send them for other people to read. But there wasn't one ceremony. Well, then how did the how did the funeral itself go in Mount Vernon? And was that sort of minor by comparison with the other things going on elsewhere? So the funeral itself was certainly larger than Washington had hoped for. And yet it was not as massive as some of the other ceremonies that we will see 
and talk about later that ca- that came afterwards. Right. And partly that was because of the limitations of travel. So only local people could really show up. So Washington's family was there, although Martha felt that she was not capable of attending. She was too grief stricken. So she didn't actually attend the burial ceremony. Many of his former aides, Tobias Lear, who had been his secretary and sort of his office manager when he was president, was present. A lot of the local masons, the local militias from Alexandria, a lot of the people that Washington had known, whether it was through the school he had helped found or the tradespeople that he worked with in Alexandria, they attended. Local friends and family came. And of course, all of the enslaved people who were at Mount Vernon were present as well. So it was certainly a good-sized gathering, but it wasn't the thousands and thousands and thousands of people that we would see later. And what about the other ones? Do we have any indication of the size of the Washington, uh, size of the Philadelphia one, the size of the New York one? Well, admittedly, the numbers are a little hard to quantify because they often exaggerated for effect. But uh, people Uh. (laughs) people who were present at the Philadelphia ceremony where Congress was located, where the seat of government was located, I should say, reported that when Congress had its official procession to go to the local church to hear the service, the streets were filled with people and were so crowded that it took like twice as long as they had anticipated to get from Congress Hall to the church. And so based on those reports, it would indicate that thousands and thousands of people were present and filling the streets to be a part of this procession. And how was it reported in the press at the time? As as buzzkillers know or should know, the press is actually quite vigorous in this period you know, there, there's, there are a lot of newspapers around in every town. Was it reported as sort of the National Day of Mourning or the National Days or Week of Mourning? It was certainly widely reported. So it, almost as soon as Washington died, Tobias Lear sent a letter on behalf of Martha to John Adams, the president at the time, and to Congress to alert them to let them know. Uh, and partly that was because technically Washington was still under commission as the commander in chief of the new army that John Adams had organized and partly because, of course, the the role he played as this national figure. And that... Oh, yeah. I, I always forget that. <laughs> yeah, he I was, forget he was that. still technically involved. He do, yeah, he doesn't completely retire. Yeah. He becomes, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I would say, actually, um, not to get into any spoiler alerts, I'm working on a book on John Adams' presidency right now. <laughs> and I actually think this portion of Washington's life is the lowest moment of his public service career. But we can come back to that. Wow. <laughs> so uh, they alert John Adams and they alert Congress that this has happened. And immediately the newspapers pick up the news because Congress doesn't keep it a secret. And so reports start to trickle out from Philadelphia. And often the way news was shared at this time is the Philadelphia newspapers would print a story and then the New York newspaper would take a snippet from that story and reprint it. Yeah. So they did that. But because Washington died in December of 1799, It was, and the news sort of trickled across the country, not super slowly, but it took, you know, sometimes it could take up to a couple weeks to get all the way up and down the continent. And his birthday was in February. It kind of produced a couple months period of mourning. And so the newspapers over that period of time, they would print letters that were reflections of Washington. They were print they printed snippets from the more famous or enjoyable or laudatory eulogies, things like that over that period of time. So there wasn't ever one designated day. It kind of ended up being this period up to his birthday. Well this is a good place for us to take a break. Um, we'd like to come back and talk more about the other presidents that you discuss, other presidential funerals and mourning periods you discuss in the book. So we'll be back with Dr. Travinsky in just a moment. All right, Buzzkillers, we are back with Dr. Lindsay Travinsky, who's here to talk to us about a great new book that she's edited with Matthew Costello called Mourning the President's Loss and Legacy in American Culture. And we talked before the break about the book in general, but also about George Washington's funeral, and it's it's very one of the many interesting things about the book is it's George Washington's funeral, the mourning, the way things were sort of observed across the country did not necessarily create a precedent for other funerals until much much later. But I think perhaps one of the most fascinating things about the book 
is that you decided we're not just going to do the famous ones. You know, you have Washington in there, you have Jefferson in there, you have Andrew Jackson and on and on. But you, you're also including Zachary Taylor. You're also including presidents who were not popular, Andrew Johnson, things like that. So I wonder if we might do something special in the second half and take two presidents, uh, take two examples. The first, the com a comparison of Lincoln's mourning period and funeral and Andrew Johnson's mourning, the, the president who, who succeeded, him, succeeded him, mourning period and funeral, and then later do FDR and Hoover, because again, these are like one famous, well-regarded president and one not famous, not well-regarded president. So let's talk about Lincoln. Now, first of all, I think everyone knows, of course, what happened to Lincoln, the assassination, and tons of people have seen Lincoln, pictures of the Lincoln coffin being taken being taken on the train, being driven through Washington, and even a little Teddy Roosevelt leaning out the window, looking at it, and, and things like that. But they don't know very much about the mourning and about the other things surrounding his funeral. What happened then in, in, in those ways? Yeah, I think that's a great place to start. And I'm so glad that you like the approach. I think one of the really fascinating things about some of the chapters that are, you know, the lesser knowns, which we'll get to, is that it reveals an awful lot about what we choose to remember. And that in a, and that a lot of right, ways right, is right, almost right. more more interesting about the American people. Lincoln was, of course, by the end of the Civil War, quite beloved because of his role in preserving the Union, in winning the Civil War. Of course, it hadn't, you know, fully wrapped up and reconstruction was still to come, but everyone could kind of see the direction it was going when he was killed. We sometimes forget, because we know what happens afterwards, that Lincoln was the first president to be assassinated while in office. And yeah, yeah. it's really hard to undersell how traumatic and shocking that was for the American people, especially because it came after four years of unbelievably gruesome civil war. And so the trauma that was inflicted by this death is almost impossible to describe. It, it truly felt like just this shocking catastrophe to many Americans, not all, which I'll get to in a second, but mm. to many Americans. <laughs> and so when we think about that grief, we have to try and put ourselves in the place of the shock and the terror and the newness of this situation. Now, when Lincoln died, there were certain groups of people who were, frankly, quite thrilled. Uh, there were a lot of Southerners who were Confederate, who had either served in the Confederate Army, who had been Confederate sympathizers, who hated Lincoln, who despised Lincoln, who mm. viewed him as the destroyer of their way of life. So they were obviously not particularly sad to see him go. And indeed, John Wilkes Booth was driven by the Confederate ideology and white supremacy. And so Lincoln's death was very much a product of the Civil War. There were also a, a crew of Northern Democrats, which were sometimes called Copperheads, who felt like they had been sort of pro-Union, but had been anti-Lincoln. And they weren't particularly sorry to see him go either. However, most Americans were devastated. And one, I think, subset of the population in particular, which the author of this chapter is Martha Hodes. And this was actually derived from a, a full book that she's written on the subject called Morning Lincoln, phenomenal Lincoln historian, demonstrates that African Americans in particular felt that Lincoln had died for them, mm -hmm. that he had been killed because of the stances he had taken. And so there was a particular form of grief in that population understanding who would come next. And I think Black Americans were among the first to recognize that Johnson would be no friend to their cause. Right, right. So that was sort of the approach. In terms of the way people mourned, the news, of course, started in Washington, D.C., but by this point, technology has evolved. So the Telegraph was able to spread the news quite quickly across the country. It was printed in newspapers. People pretty much knew the next day. Most official buildings were immediately draped in black crepe-like material, which was to designate an official mourning period, almost like we would lower the flag at half mast today. Yeah. And people ordered this material and clothing and armbands to signify mourning at the time uh, across the country. So there was a boom in the production of black material for people to be able to express their sorrow over his death. 
the morning celebrations, unlike Washington, did actually officially take place with Lincoln's coffin across the country. So Mm -hmm. he died in Washington. He laid in state and mourners were able to go pay respects. In an interesting parallel to Martha Washington, uh, Mary Lincoln was not able to attend those ceremonies because she was so grief stricken. She couldn't bring herself to, to go see the coffin. The coffin was then loaded onto a train and taken back to Illinois. And along the way, the American people lined up to send him off with their respects to show their grief to try and get one last glimpse of the president who was who would become so beloved and would remain so beloved in American memory. And you mentioned earlier on, uh, slightly earlier on, you know, of course, not all Americans mourned the death, certainly uh, the the Confederacy didn't, uh, the former Confederacy didn't. How did they, how do those people, and maybe even the Copperheads, talk about the the, uh, the observances and the funeral it's, itself did they think it was excessive did they think it shouldn't be like the, like it was they did there were there were actually examples in cities like New York City where there were populations of copperheads some Irish immigrants in particular resented what they saw as favoritism for Black Americans because they were concerned that recently emancipated African Americans from the South would come North and take their jobs. There were skirmishes in the streets over morning rituals. They tried to tear down a flag or tear down this Black material. There were fights in terms of people sort of jeering at one another over eulogies and expressions of grief. There were dueling newspaper editorials. And so this this contested mourning experience was very explicit. It was not just sort of in their minds. It was often said out loud and it was fought physically, sometimes in public. Well, that, that's astounding. And is there any way to know whether the shock of an assassination made the the morning and and everything surrounding the morning more uh, I don't know prominent or or sort of turned up the volume on everything if Lincoln had been known to be sick and was and gradually on his deathbed that might be, that might have been very very different it's hard to say with complete certainty but I would certainly make that argument mm-hmm. I think that presidents who have died suddenly in a unexpected fashion, especially when it is inflicted by violence. We have another chapter on Kennedy and, and we yeah. see this as well with Kennedy's death. It tends to it tends to be more unexpected and therefore to provoke a stronger response. And I think mm-hmm. that that makes sense. The American people, if a president is sick, they have time to accustom themselves to the loss. So for example, James Garfield was shot as president, but the shot wasn't actually what killed him. It was poor medical care afterwards. And he lingered for, I think, like almost 90 days. And so over that period of time, the American people were able to sort of gradually come to terms with his death. And so we didn't see the same sort of response to his death that we saw to Lincoln or to Kennedy. I also think the moment in which those assassinations taking place matters a great deal. Mm -hmm. The Civil War, of course, is such a pivotal moment. The Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s are such a pivotal moment. And those assassinations often feel like turning points, which I think only accelerates the legacy of that president. Whereas McKinley, that doesn't feel as much like a turning point. And so his assassination Mm -hmm. maybe isn't remembered in the same way. And then I also think it has a lot to do with what comes after. So Lincoln was followed by one of the worst presidents. I would put him in bottom three, maybe Mm -hmm. bottom four. Mm -hmm. And while I don't think his legacy needed a whole lot of help anyway, it certainly only looked better in comparison with Andrew Johnson coming afterwards. Yes. Well, as you you say quite rightly, Andrew Johnson is considered one of the worst presidents in in American history and was partly reviled at the time by certainly Republicans in the North because, of course, he was a Democrat, which is which was an odd thing, although Lincoln did it to try to shore up the support from the border states in the election of 1864. Johnson goes on to serve a terrible term. He's, his Reconstruction, his effect on Reconstruction was horrible, and he's, he's, he's impeached. How then, after he leaves office, he isn't thrown out of office, but how does it, after he leaves office, what happens to him, and then eventually, how what happens when he dies? 
Well, you're right. He was already sort of disliked before Lincoln's death. And in fact, he came to their inauguration when he was inaugurated as vice president so drunk that he wasn't able to really give his speech properly. And someone had to essentially pull him down by his coattails to get him to stop talking. So that's never a great way to start your time in office. (laughs) So, you know, there were not high expectations from him, I think, from the get-go. And had Lincoln, of course, know what was happening, I don't think there's any way he would have picked Johnson to be his, or he wouldn't have considered Johnson. And I don't think the people who selected Johnson at the convention would have selected him. So after Johnson's time in office, he left. He was incredibly unpopular. He had been really discredited with Northern voters. And in the South, he kind of had an uneasy relationship because he had pardoned most of the Confederates and he was a violent racist. So Uh, Black Republicans despised him because he had done so much to undermine their new civil rights. A lot of Confederates were uneasy about him because he had offered all of these pardons. He was a Southerner. He had been a slave owner himself prior to the war, and yet he had sided with the Union. So his constituency was problematic to begin with. The one place where he did kind of find a constituency in Tennessee where he had settled after the presidency was among white voters who resented the more radical approach to the Republican Party in terms of Reconstruction and Black suffrage. And so he went back to Tennessee to lick his wounds. He was there for a while, and eventually Mm -hmm. he was re-elected to office. Now, he didn't serve very long because he died very shortly into his term. He had an unexpected, probably a stroke. But he's a really good example of he's often remembered for what people want to remember them for. And this is something we see with presidents over the course of American history. So although he made his life in Tennessee after the presidency and and during the Civil War, he was actually from North Carolina. And he represented a certain type of North Carolinian farmer, not the super wealthy plantation owner from the East, but more of the humble human farmer pull himself up from his bootstraps, Scotch-Irish representatives in the western region of North Carolina. And so if you go to North Carolina today, unlike other places where statues have been taken down of people like Jackson or other, you know, violent racists, a lot of this stuff commemorating him still exists in North Carolina. And Brandon Robinson, who wrote our chapter on Johnson, really kind of got into these details is why hasn't he had sort of the same mm. backlash in terms of the markers of commemoration that we would see some of the other people? So is there a morning in North Carolina greater than a morning in a morning period in North Carolina greater than a morning period in Tennessee, or is it just different because they you know they just say he was born here, or does this come later on during the law the lost cause in the Jim Crow period? Well, initially, most of the mourning is localized in Tennessee. Yeah. Some of the local soldiers, local officials come and pay their respects. They are present for his funeral. It is much smaller in scale than some of the other ones mm. that we've talked about, and even some of the other presidents that came before him that weren't people like Lincoln. So the immediate mourning is is pretty localized. North Carolina did right away recognize his birth and his presence there, but the commemoration really actually started to to kick up during what we would think of as the Jim Crow lost cause era. So Andrew Johnson was a really useful tool to suggest that the war was not about slavery, Uh. but was actually about a state's rights because he himself had owned enslaved individuals prior to the war, but he remained loyal to the union. And so he was very helpful as a marker for what the South wanted to proclaim as its reasons for seceding. So he's used very much in a different way than Lincoln's memory is used and used much later. Yes, absolutely. So there are some there are some statues and some commemorations in North Carolina, and he's often placed 
in sort of the same category, weirdly, as Andrew Jackson. So they put him in this sort of pantheon of Southerners that fit into a nice little box that works for them as a as a history of how they want to represent the South and what the Southern way of life was supposed to be like. Oh, absolutely fascinating. Well, let's go to the 20th century because, again, we have this juxtaposition of two presidents of what mostly, mostly considered a failed presidency, Herbert Hoover, and mostly considered a successful presidency and a beloved president and a very big shock when he died. FDR. If we take FDR first, because FDR dies in 45, and Hoover doesn't die until the late 60s, so there's a, there's a big gap. Let's take FDR first, even though he comes second in the sort of line of presidents after Hoover. Most people know about the shocking news of his death, and the, the nation is plunged into mourning even before the funeral starts. Well, what are the new things that your book, uh, that this book brings up? brings to the to this discussion? Well, I think there are a couple of aspects of FDR's death that are useful to know. So David Wilner contributed our FDR chapter. He's written a great deal about FDR, so a great source there to begin with. He digs into the question of how much was actually known ahead of time. Hmm. How much did FDR know that he was unwell? How much did his family know he was unwell? How much did his fourth term contribute to his death? And he comes to the conclusion that FDR knew he had a heart condition, but he probably didn't know it was as bad as it was, that the doctors maybe weren't totally transparent with him and with Eleanor about the risks of taking on the stress of a fourth term and what that would do to his body. Now, one might argue, if you look at pictures of FDR, it's pretty clear to see the stress that the presidency was taking yeah. on him as an individual. And he had, of course, had health problems for a very long time because of the after effects of polio. But what I think David does a really great job of is demonstrating that basically FDR and Eleanor came to the conclusion that if the presidency cost him his life, then that was just what the cost was going to have to be to try and see the war to its conclusion. And he unfortunately did not live to see all of the end of the war, but it was pretty clear which direction it was headed when he did ultimately die. And he decided to run for a fourth term because he felt like there was no one else that was waiting in the wings for the Democratic Party that could achieve those aims, that could see the war to the finish line and achieve the kind of outcome that was required. Mm -hmm. He also does a great job of showing how meticulous FDR was in playing a role in cultivating that legacy. And this is something we see with some early presidents. Washington cultivated his papers. He made sure they were preserved. He made sure they were available to historians. But FDR was the first to uh, have a presidential library, mm -hmm. and he was meticulous in making sure his presidency was documented for posterity. And in doing so, even though he didn't live past his time in office, he did leave his thumbprint on how we remember him. And then we have Herbert Hoover, who of course had been president before FDR, but who outlives not only FDR, obviously, but he even outlives Kennedy, doesn't die till 64, which gives plenty of time for a sort of reassessment of Hoover in theory, although he's also considered like, like Johnson and these others as a, very, as a very failed president. What happens when he dies? Well, Herbert Hoover is such an interesting example of someone who tries really, really hard to construct what their legacy is supposed to be. So as you said, he left office in 1933, and he was unbelievably unpopular. Most Americans blamed him, if not for the Great Depression, for not doing anything or for making it worse. And one of the things that this, I think, chapter does a really good job of by uh, Dean Koslowski is he digs into Hoover's ideology and Hoover really was an ideologue. Mm -hmm. He genuinely believed that the market would take care of it, that the government was not supposed to play a role. And he grew to loathe FDR because he did play such an active role. So he did not only despised FDR kind of personally, but also for everything he stood for. So their relationship was terrible during their transition. He then was very much out of favor 
Uh, and then he spent really the next two, three decades trying to discredit the New Deal, argue for a form of small C conservatism that was a very small government, a limited government, a non-active government. He did consult with other presidents because he had actually had incredible incredible success prior to his presidency yes, yeah. as Secretary of Commerce and managing the post-World War I aid effort in Europe. So he had had this incredible career that we don't really remember, but Europeans remember because of his success. Hoover advised many Republicans, including Eisenhower. He was friendly with Nixon when Nixon was vice president for Eisenhower. And he uh, really played a strong central role in kind of behind the scenes, but in the Republican Party after leaving office. And then he played a large role in the founding of the Hoover Institute at Stanford, which is still a very important scholarly center that tends to run a little bit more traditionally conservative. Right. And he played a big role in making sure his papers were there. There was financial funding for this type of conservative scholarship and really tried to craft a legacy for himself that was not the one that most Americans remembered in 1933. And how does, but how does his funeral or his funeral and his mourning, how does that kind of happen publicly? Do we know, is there a sense of people have forgiven, forget by this stage? I know I've even seen Hoover interviewed on, on uh, news analysis programs in the fifties, you know, about stuff and about the government. So it, clearly there were people who didn't hate him. They just thought that that he again, he firmly believed almost in a religious fervor uh, in in his ec ec laissez faire economics, and so it was sort of like given a I almost he's given a pass, but you know what I mean? Yeah, he's not treated as a moral outrage like Andrew Johnson was. Well, I think in some ways Hoover's legacy benefited from his lengthy post presidential tenure because he died when he did. It gave him and his legacy time for there to be an alternative to FDR's New Deal vision. By the time Hoover died, mm -hmm. there was a rising conservative movement, largely in reaction to the New Deal state. And Hoover was really the embodiment of that. He was just the embodiment of that you know, 20, 30 years earlier. And so there were people by right. the time he died who thought he had been right, who agreed with what he had to say, who had adopted this approach, just maybe in a slightly modernized or updated version. And so he did serve as a speaker. He served as a guest. He served as a consultant. He served as a spokesperson. And he, of course, created his own presidential library. By this point, that was sort of the standard mm. process. He really made it a embodiment of his values and what he saw as the appropriate approach to government and the American way of life. He grew to really love the community surrounding the library. And so when his wife died and ultimately when he died, he elected to have both of them buried at the library because it was mm -hmm. symbolic of the approach that he had taken to both his public service and to governing. Yes, it's absolutely fascinating. And in a way, this the Hoover instance kind of summarizes the whole book in that there's so much more to these deaths and these funerals and these mournings than just death, funeral, and mourning. Sometimes there are legacies. Sometimes there are, as you say in the, the Kennedy chapter, LBJ is able to use that mourning to, to push for more civil rights legislation. That Kennedy probably wouldn't have been able to pass. Johnson passed, got it passed, but Kennedy is the credit, which is another point in that chapter. And on and on and on. There, the, the, it, you know, people always ask me, how is it possible that that there needs to be more research on historical topics? Sure, haven't we done all, everything that needs to be done? Hasn't everything already been discovered? Already? And this is a perfect example of uh, the fact that it hasn't. You know, you know, I think differently about the presidency in general than I did before I read this book. Oh, I'm so glad. I, I'm so delighted to hear that. I, I mean, I also think one of the, the points that is both, that is captured by some of the chapters, you know, Jefferson, Jackson, Theodore Roosevelt in particular, and then of course the H.W. Bush chapter, which sort of served as the initial inspiration, is that legacies change over time. So mm. history can't be static because yeah. 
how we see them, how we approach them, which questions we ask, what sources we have access to does change. And so, for example, the Jefferson chapter written by Andrew Davenport talks about the mourning process from the perspective largely of the enslaved population at Monticello, which was, of course, not at all discussed in the coverage of Jefferson's funeral and death when he died. Mm. And yet the impact on their lives was extraordinary because most of the enslaved individuals were sold or auctioned across the country. And so that is an example where the initial history of Jefferson's death and mourning is incomplete because it only tells a portion of the story. And now yeah. that we kind of can have the perspective that we do, we can tell that that full story. Well, I can't recommend it highly enough. It's a, it's a fabulous book, and it's great because, of course, different chapters written by different people taking different emphases in, 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 on, on the different presidencies and the deaths and the funerals and the mourning periods. It's absolutely gripping stuff. And we're, we're so lucky. In, in, in this year, we've had two, we've had a few great books, Myth America, come out, which has a similar approach, different, you know, historians are contributing. This come out, and again, it really is a, a time to stop and think about the ways in which history is, is constructed. So it just remains for me to say thank you, Dr. Travinsky, for coming on the show again. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. And thank you for allowing me to share this work with your audience. And thank you to the audience for being interested in history. That is really the greatest yeah. gift for people like myself or, you know, Kevin Cruz or Julian or my co-editor, Matthew. The fact that we're able to share this work with people is extraordinary. Well, and Buzzkill is, as you know, the book is on the Buzzkill bookshelf. Please go get it there. Please go to professorbuzzkill.com and do all the things you need to do there. Sign up for the free newsletter, rate and review us on iTunes and all that kind of stuff. And we will talk to all of you out there next week. 